What's up, everybody? It's Jordan, and welcome to Sports Street Hind Show. And on today's video, I am joined by a special guest. He was an all-pro, a three-time pro bowler, and he was in, inducted into the Marshall Athletic Hall of Fame. I have Marshall and Minnesota Vikings legend Carl Lee joining me today. How are you doing today, Carl? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing really, really good. I, I really appreciate you, you know, taking time in your day to join me today. We have a lot to talk about, and, you know, we'll go ahead and get started here. So you kind of grew up, you know, in South Charleston and you went to Marshall. Was Marshall your dream school or how did that, you know, come up that you decided to play at Marshall? <laughs> no, actually, I, at my first visit to Marshall, um, I had a I had a high school buddy, Mike Johnson, who had who had was playing at Marshall. He was a senior um, and I talked to him and uh, the game that I watched, they got beat really bad and and and. The coach was on his uh, basically on his way out. They, I think, they fired him maybe like a couple days later, and it just didn't it just didn't feel good to me. Um, I had gone to Virginia Tech. I'd had a couple trips to Virginia Tech. I thought maybe something there might take place, but they ended up asking me to walk on, and that wasn't possible. And other than Marshall at the time, the only schools that were out there were some of those some of the local state schools. I had gone to Concord. I had gone to Fairmont on visits. So, I mean, I wasn't really, you know, there were some other schools from out of state, but they were, you know, basically still small type schools, but nobody had not before visit other than Virginia Tech. And, and like I said, that fell through. And then, like I said, then the, the situation with Marshall and I was like, nah, man, I'm not, I'm not going here. And then the next week, Sonny Randall come. They hire Sonny Randall. I go back down, and as soon as I met him, I was I was done. I was like, you know, I signed when I on my visit. Um, I was impressed with him, the fact that he had played in the NFL, and he had told me that if I was good enough, he'd at least get me a, a chance to get a tryout, and that was enough for me. That that sealed the deal for me. You know, obviously you did, you know, end up going to the NFL, but, you know, going to Marshall, you know, and you spent a couple of years there and you ended up, you know, being in the inducted into the Marshall Athletic Hall of Fame in 1995. What's it like, you know, throughout that process and what's it like, you know, seeing your hard work pay off getting inducted into the Marshall Hall of Fame? You know, I, I give all that credit really to to Coach Randall, Coach Pruitt. You know, we had a great coaching staff and they allowed me and put me in a spot coach coach Pruitt was my DB coach and he put me in a <clears throat> excuse me in a position where I could legitimately play and do well at it and they they gave me the confidence and the push to to be as good as I could be so that induction to the Hall of Fame had a lot to do with the coaches that that coached me and got me actually to the NFL you know, you mentioned Bobby Pruitt. Uh, many consider him to be the best, you know, Marshall coach of all time. And, you know, Marshall now has, you know, Charles Tuff, you know, a really promising head coach going into his second season. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, Marshall's head coach, uh, Charles Huff? Fortunately, I was on the uh, select committee and he was, you know, hearing him talk and being a football player and hearing him talk and the things that he said. Like, I was not even aware of some of the 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 processes that go that would that he would go through as a coach to vet players to to make them better year after year he had so much knowledge and it was just so much different than all of the other coaches that I had seen and and so he was definitely a a, a vote of mine he just he just he just knew football and again you know you come through Alabama with Nick Saban how are you not going to know football I mean, yeah, Nick Saban's, you know, best coach of all time. If you learn from him, you're going to be a great coach. And Absolutely. You've seen so many of these coaches, you know, people like Kirby Smart, you know, who's kind of from the Nick Saban tree and go off yeah. to be great coaches. Hopefully Huff can become that with Marshall. And, you know, there's lots of intrigue with Marshall this season because, you know, they're no longer in Conference USA. They spent over 15 years there. They're now in the Sun Belt, a really great conference. What are your kind of thoughts on them leaving Conference USA to go to the Sun Belt? You know, I've had that question asked me asked me several times, and 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 I always look at that and say, when it's when it comes to changing conferences, I really think it is up to 
the, the head coach and the administration to look at a whole host of things, whether it's travel, whether it's, you know, just any, any detail, where can we compete? Where can we get a better look? Where can we get our players exposed, get better exposure? There's a lot of details that go into that, that helps a school, whether it's financially or, or wins and losses and whatever that reason is, it's usually, they try to get to the best place. And I think that, uh, I'm sure that Coach Huff had reasons behind it. I don't know specifically, but I like it because I think he must have seen something. The administrative must have seen something that was going to be a better fit for Marshall. And when you look at the Sun Belt, I feel like the Sun Belt has much more competition mm -hmm. than Summers USA has. And I feel like you can get the best of your players. You know, competition only brings the best of the people. So I feel like that's something good for Marshall. Can really play better schools than compared to Conference USA. Right. So, you know, new uh, conference – uh, Huff's second season. Uh, you you kind of have like a maybe a record prediction for Marshall this year? No, I don't think I can dare throw that out there. I I, I would I'd like to think I'd like to think that they're gonna they will find themselves somewhere up and around the top of the conference. Not necessarily sure that it that they may win the conference, but I think that they're gonna be they'll be competitive and they'll be somewhere up around the top is what I'm thinking and at least I'm hoping. Yeah, it should be interesting because when, when you're playing these teams like Appalachian State, you know, Louisiana mm -hmm. teams who have been really, really dominant these last several years, then you add, you know, the non-conference game against Notre Dame, you know, everybody's talking about it's a really, really tough schedule, but, you know, hopefully they, you know, they play really good this year. And, you know, you were drafted, you know, after Marshall, you were drafted by the Vikings and uh, you spent, you know, over a decade with the Vikings. And, you know, there was some big moves from Minnesota this past season. You know, they ended up firing Mike Zimmer after eight and nine years, what were your kind of thoughts on uh, Minnesota firing uh, Mike Zimmer? I think it, you know, nothing personally against him. I think it was time. I think there was, there was just, I think the team got stagnant and there were opportunities that were, I think that were missed. Um, I think games that they should have won, that they didn't win. And, um, and, and to be honest, I think they're stuck in, in a financial crunch with the quarterback. I just, you know, my own personal view is I'm not sure that, that the quarterback that's going to take us to um, get us through a playoff, get us to a possible um, Super Bowl opportunity, I don't know if they have that quarterback there. But I know they've invested a lot of money in him, and I think that's going to be tough. And I'm I'm really curious to see, you know, what a new coach will do with that. I mean, obviously there's not, I don't know how much he can do. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there's trade opportunities. I don't know what you do if you cut him. I don't know how much of the guarantees are there. I think it's a really, really tough situation that I think they created at the quarterback position. And, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, when Mike Zimmer, it was kind of time, you know, I, I'm a big Bengals fan. I kind of felt the same way with Marvin Lewis, a guy who's a good mm -hmm. coach, but just couldn't really get to that next level. And he just, you know, kind of felt like it was time they had to, you know, be fired. And you're talking about, you know, Kirk Cousins, you know, they bring in a new head coach, uh, Kevin O'Connell. You know, he spent times with the Rams. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts on that hiring, uh, for getting an offensive minded coach in Minnesota, opposed to, you know, Mike Zimmer, like they previously had, who was more so of a defensive minded coach? I, I, you know, defense wins championships. And, but I think, I think, football has become offensively influenced. I think that you need guys that understand and know offenses in order to, to be productive. Um, it doesn't always carry you over the hump, you know, as far as winning the Super Bowl. that's usually the best defenses tend to, to, to do that or whoever plays the best defense. If it's two offensive guys that are in that Super Bowl, usually the team that plays the best defense usually wins, but, I think this is an opportunity, I think maybe the last opportunity for someone to be able to come in and put Kirk Cousins in a situation to where he can play well and take a team to the playoffs. I think he has to, he has, you know, I think you have to do that and and potentially even play in a Super Bowl to say that this is a, this would be a successful season and or if Kirk Cousins can be the guy. 
And when you look at Kirk Cousins, you know, he was drafted in 2012, and he, the, I would say he doesn't really have a whole lot of years left. And it's interesting, you know, this quarterback situation with Minnesota, especially getting a new offensive guy. So let's maybe say, you know, Minnesota is kind of in this 8-9 situation again. Who's to say, I mean, they don't maybe draft a quarterback early next year to kind of get their, you know, quarterback of the future. That should be really interesting for Minnesota. But you look at their offseason, I think they're one of the more underrated teams this season. You know, they signed Darius Smith. They had a really nice draft. Mm -hmm. um, so you have kind of maybe a record prediction for Minnesota uh, for the upcoming year? I, I personally think that – I'll say it this way. I think conference-wise, I think that they can battle for two, three, you know, maybe maybe second in the conference, maybe third at – you know, I think they can be up at the top of the conference. Wins and losses, I don't know. I don't know how, exactly how strong the conference will be as a whole, but – I think that I think in that conference, I think that they can they can be up at the top. I think they can get into the playoffs. I think they're more than good enough to get in the playoffs. I think that they could be good enough to maybe go forward. I just I, I, I what concerns me is the leadership on the offensive side from the quarterback. That's the scariest piece for me. I think that there's a, there's a whole lot of talent. Um, but, you know, which is not necessarily the best example because there's very few Brady's. But you see that leadership that a quarterback like that does to a team. No matter what team he goes to, all of a sudden guys want to be around him. They, they'll play better. And I'm not saying that Kirk Cousins has to be Tom Brady, but he, but he has to be – there has to be some – form of that i don't personally see that kind of leadership from afar you know maybe it is you know maybe he maybe he does that and i don't want to make this a, a a total rant about him but i i just think that the leadership piece of this and the quarterback spot and the offensive side is all led by that specific guy that is the quarterback you know you get all the credit but you have to be you know there's also the blame that comes with that and you look at the, the Vikings compared to the Packers. I, I think the Vikings have a much better roster than the Packers. But like you're saying, the, just, the difference between them is just the quarterbacks. I mean, yes. the, I mean, Rodgers makes the Packers great with a horrible roster. And Cousins is, you know, barely taking this Minnesota team to the playoffs with a very, very underrated roster. And that's, that's really the th main thing to me that kind of separates these two teams because – if they just had a slightly better quarterback, the Vikings, to me, I would I think they could very well end up winning the NFC North this year. But when you're playing against arguably the best quarterback um, in the NFL, it's, it's kind of hard to do that when your quarterback's very consistent, as in Cousins. You're you're exactly right. I think, you know, again, when you look at the teams, it, go around the league. When you look at the quarterback and look at the team, it usually reflects the quarterback, you know, because that is the guy. They could have a great defense. They could have an average defense. But if you've got a great quarterback, a quarterback that's lead, that's a leader who's been around, who understands the game, you're, you're competitive. You've got a shot. You're a team that somebody's thinking, oh, might be in the playoffs. Just because you've got that quarterback. Yeah, I, I've told people before, like when you look at wins and losses, I, I feel like at least 85 to 90 percent of the time you look at the team who won, they're going to have the better quarterback. You know, it's yeah. not a coincidence when you see, you know, Brady's and, you know, Rodgers, people like Russell Wilson, who have been some of the best quarterbacks in the league for a decade, that they're winning and they have the best quarterback as well. You see these teams like, let's say, uh, Tennessee with Tannehill or, you know, Cousins, teams who have an all right quarterback, but they're not on these levels because they don't have a, a great quarterback like some of those other teams. And the crazy thing about it is you got to pay them according to the pay scale. You know, when those contracts come up, in order to keep them, you, you have to pay them on the pay scale of, of other of those quarterbacks who are great. And and now you've got money vested in them. And now, you know, you, you don't get to where you want to go. What what do you do? You know, and, that, and and when you start talking guaranteed money, you know, that's money that you can't just just let go. You got to try to find a way to get that player to play. And when you look at the Vikings, it should be very interesting in these next couple of years because, you know, with a new head coach, there's a chance maybe he brings in a new guy, maybe like a draft pick or something like that to maybe replace Cousins. But 
to be very interesting with Minnesota. And, you know, you played for Minnesota for over a decade. During that time you played with the Vikings, you had a chance to play against some of the greatest players of all time, arguably the best two running backs of all time, you know, Barry Sanders and Walter Payton. How was it How was it like game planning against those running backs, and how was it like playing against those uh, two greats and Barry Sanders and Walter Payton? Well, the, the good thing about B- Barry Sanders was – he, he, he wasn't necessarily big, but so if you could get your hands on him, you could at least get him down. The problem was getting your hands on him. Um, Peyton, to me, you know, there, there were a lot of big backs back in those days, too. Um, you know, Earl Campbell was, was winding his career up. Um, uh, Pete Johnson from, I think, Cincinnati. Um so there was some big guys, and Peyton wasn't overly big. He he was muscular, short, and stocky. But, man, the power and the determination that, that he brought with every run that he made was just unbelievable. He was not the guy that you wanted to, you know, especially as a DB, that matchup was not a good one for me, uh, me and him one-on-one. That's not one that I'd be happy to happy to have. Um but again, you start looking at you start looking at guys that were playing, you know, even some of the linemen. Um, there were some really great players in that decade um, that, you know, Hall of Fame guys. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, you got a guy like a, a guy like Sterling Sharp, who has not made it in the Hall of Fame, but is by far, you know, he was the only other receiver that were that was even remotely close. Him and him and Jerry Rice battled back and forth season after season once he got in of catches and most yards, most touchdowns and all of that. And yet he's not in the hall. Um, you know, there were great receivers. Everybody had a receiver. You had, you had, you had um, Andre Reed, you had Ryzen, you had all these guys that were all over the place. Everywhere you went, there was a guy that could catch the ball. There was a guy that could run the ball, you know, the bigger names obviously stand out, but I don't think there was anybody who did not have a great running back or a great receiver and or a great quarterback. I mean, you, you look at Miami, Miami, Duper and Clayton with, with, with Marino, you know, Denver, you know, you got Elway. I mean, I mean, it was just, it was just, there was no relief. There was no week that just like, oh, okay, this quarterback's not good. And all oh, those receivers are not good. Oh, they don't have a good back. You never had that weekend. And then you're, you're talking about, you know, Andre Reed. To me, he was a extremely underrated receiver. And I feel like, you know, he's in the Hall of Fame and he played for Buffalo. That kind of shows you how good he must be for, you know, not a top market team. And he's still in the Hall of Fame. He gets talked about a lot. But I feel like if he would have played for, let's say the Cowboys, the Steelers, he would be talked about as one of the best receivers of all time, you know, much more talked about. Yes. And you're talking about these receivers. So, you know, you playing in secondary, who would you say would be the top five toughest receivers you had to go up against? Well, I, I and people have asked that question to me a lot. And and the, the thing about that question is, you know, you look at a guy like Willie Gold, who wasn't necessarily anywhere in the, in the, line of being one of the best receivers but because he was so fast you know he created his own issues with with defensive backs because he was so fast you know he might you know he can get behind you and scare you to death and you know he may or may not make that catch but it you know he was a guy that you didn't want to go against because he was so fast but if i had if i had to try to give you five names off the top of my head i'd go you know at one, I'd give you two of them. I'd give you Sterling and 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 Rice. Um, after that, I'd probably go um, uh, Andre Reed. Um, I'd probably give you Ryzen, and and you got Duper and Clayton. Um, I mean, again, it's it's just there were so many, you know. But but I I put that group out there. And feel comfortable and say, okay, well, somebody could challenge that, but you can't take anything away from the guys that you named. Yeah, those so those were some really, really good receivers. And you know, throughout your playing career, you know, with Minnesota or maybe even you know playing against people, who would you say were some of the more you know underrated uh, players you played with or against? 
Oh, well, the first one is Anthony Carter. And I would I would name him. I played with him, but I would name him as a, as good as a receiver as anybody. Um, I mean, we go into San Francisco with no chance of winning. He decides to return kicks and punts. He returns, I think, a kickoff for sure, a punt return. I think he was he scored a punt return for a touchdown. He torched their secondary and literally outplayed Rice by without any question. And he's he's a guy that's never really gotten a lot of attention, and maybe because we didn't win a Super Bowl. Um, but he was to me, he's probably the most underrated player in the league. You know, him and and again, I don't know why it's receiver, but you know, Sterling wasn't a, a, a media guy, so I don't know if that works against him. Anthony Carter wasn't really a media guy. He didn't turn it away, but he wasn't interested in really doing a lot of interviews. He just played. And I think sometimes, you know, that is sometimes your voting group. And I think, you know, that that may play some part of not voting or voting against them. But, you know, I think Anthony Carter is somebody who's truly been, you know, um, left out. And, you know, and then again, there's, you know, there's a guy like Chris Carter who who got a lot of attention, who was a great receiver, who's also in the Hall of Fame. Um, I just don't know where the attention, what creates the attention to a receiver at the same team, but you don't give it to another guy. I just don't, you know, like I don't know how that media frenzy goes for one player versus another. Yeah, I, I completely, you know, agree with what you mean there because, you know, being a big Bengals fan, you know, Chase had a great year. and Everybody talks about him. To me, I think one of the more underrated receivers in the NFL is Tyler Boyd. He's been very productive these last few years. You see Chase getting all this attention and Tyler Boyd not getting much attention. Like you don't know where the – how he gets so much, but how he gets so little, it, it doesn't really make much sense. But, you know, those were some very underrated players who don't really get the credit they deserve. But, you know, when you're looking, you know, throughout your maybe NFL career, you have the kind of maybe like a favorite memory or story that kind of stands out to you? Probably my, my, my first Pro Bowl, you know, it was it was kind of crazy because, you know, you're walking out on the field and they're announcing – you know, they're announcing all the names and you're hearing these names and they're like the best guys in the league. And you're trying to make trying to make the case like, OK, are they actually going to call my name? Are they going to actually say my name and I've got to step forward? It's that feeling for the first time, I think. To be able to be named in that group, I think, was probably as great a moment as I can probably imagine or would have even thought I could have been part of. You know, you you know, you know, ended up going to three Pro Bowls, a very, very underrated career, having 31 interceptions for your career, 29 with Minnesota and two with New Orleans. And when you look at, back at your NFL career, playing over a decade, you know, who would you say one player in particular, maybe a player or even a coach that you learned from the most throughout your career? Pete Carroll. No hesitation. Not at all. He – um Pete gave me the philosophy of playing defensive back and he gave me the technique of playing bump and run, you know, and, you know, his, his, his conversations with me um, were like, they were like crazy conversations like that, that you wouldn't think a coach would say, like, you know, his thing was making plays, you know, as a DB, you got to make plays. You want to be good. You want to be great. Make plays. I was so used to hearing, you know, don't get beat. Don't do this. Don't do this. Be careful with this. And Pete's philosophy was so on the positive side that he allowed you because he, he let you know that you're going to get beat. You're, I mean, that's just part of it. But you make plays. The counter to that is make plays. And. And I thought it was, the, I thought it made so much sense to me. Um, then I had the opportunity as another defensive back coach, Willie Shaw, who made the, he made the case that as a coach, he can only do what 
he can do. He can only teach me what I what he can teach me. And he drove he draws this uh, football field on the board. He draws a stick man with a hat on the side and says, you know, this is him. He draws a stick man with a helmet on the field and says, that's you. You have to do everything that you can possibly do to keep your job on that field. I have to do the same thing over here. So there will be times where we'll, we will clash, but the goal and the role that you have is to maintain your job. And those, that kind of philosophy is not something that people would think coaches would talk like that, you know, you, you know, you're thinking all just all X's and O's, but it's the mindset that matters most. If you go out on the field and you've got a certain type of mindset that makes sense, like, Hey, I'm out here to make plays. And I know the coach is signaling in plays and he's telling me stuff and all that. But at the end of the day, it's me who has to perfect whatever it is that he wants me to do and be good at it. If I'm going to keep my job, that, that resonated with me and made sense to me and allowed me to play very comfortably and knowing that I control my own fate. And, you know, you're coaching, you know, high school football now and you're coaching at South Charleston. And that's where, you know, you used to play your high school days at, you know, coaching at your alumni now. Uh, was that kind of like a dream job for you? And how did that, you know, situation, you know, come to be about and everything? No, it wasn't a dream job. Unfortunately or fortunately, the job was coming open. And people had started calling me to ask me to to would I be would I consider, you know, applying for the job to, you know, bring discipline and and get, you know, they need discipline. They need this. They need that. Um, and so these are and these were people who were part of the city. And um, impactful folks in, in the city and, and just friends of mine who work in the city and. Um, it was hard to say no because the city, the city of South Charleston has been great to me. And, you know, it was, it was something that I knew that I could do. I I can't say that I can take them to a championship. I can't say um, that I can do any of those great things that everybody's hoping to get, but discipline and, and uh, those types of things, you know, I'm more that guy that comes in that, comes in and disciplines the team and gets them in, in a place. And then you hire somebody to take them. Uh, you hire a coach to kind of take them on to a championship. And I'm, you know, and I'm comfortable in that space. No, you actually, you know, coach uh, some collegiate level as well, you know, at West Virginia state. So yes. how, with coaching at West Virginia state and now coaching high school, how much you think that, you know, coaching in college kind of can help you now? <sighs> to be truthful, probably not. Not much. Um, the, the information that you know at the college level, some of the kids aren't capable of it. Um, and we've, we've struggled. My staff is full of college coaches, college players who know college information. And we're, and we're working our way trying to, to bring some of the terminology down, some of the different things down to, to make the kids comfortable and allow them to be able to play it, produce it, put it out on the field and do, and do a good job. So we're working on that change. Now it's, it is a little difficult when you come down and, you know, because these kids are, you know, they don't necessarily always have a study time or a film session or, you know, even understand what it really, what you're even supposed to get from a film session, you know, that's so that's tough um, for these young kids. So, you know, coaching at South Charleston this season, can you kind of tell us some of the you know, listeners who can, can find out, you know, your schedules and stuff like that? Fortunately enough, we, most of our games, we will be on television. Um, we, we open up um, with Morgantown uh, actually tomorrow and that, that will be televised. Um, HD media will will stream uh, most of our games. I think if I'm repeating the uh, athletic director's uh, quote to me was, we will be the most covered team in the state this year. Um, so it won't be hard to find us. That's a really, really cool. So can you kind of tell us some of the you know listeners, you know, where they can find you on social media, if you have anything like that? 
I'm on LinkedIn. That's I'm the only uh, that's the only social media uh, uh, platform that I'm on. Um, is 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 basically just LinkedIn. That's 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 as far as I go. All right. I really, really appreciate you, you know, taking the time you did today. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. I uh, thank you all so much for watching. If you're new to the channel or we've seen my videos before, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time on the Sports Dude Hunt Show.